Good morning. Welcome to West Campus. Would you stand? I'm going to read a scripture from uh, 2 Peter. It says, You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So let's sing about that new heaven and that new earth this morning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm starting the song. That's right. <laughs> Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies, and they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. 
love that that song, the Lord promises to give rest for the weary soul. If you're weary this morning, you have come to the right place. First Peter tells us that uh, we need to cast our anxiety and all our cares on him. So this morning, don't let anything hinder you from coming into the Lord's presence and casting your cares on him. You don't need to think about the person next to you. You don't need to think about what you got going this afternoon. Um, just focus in on the Lord and praise his name because he is worthy to be adored this morning. Let's lift our voice and continue to worship. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior that could Thank you. 
Good morning, West Campus. It is so nice to see you. Um, I was not here last Sunday. I missed it. We had no water at our house, so that was super fun. Um, so it's nice to be back. If you are a first-time guest, we just want to say welcome to Walnut Ridge West Campus. Um, in just a minute, there is going to be a QR code on the screen instead of me. Hopefully that happens sooner rather than later. Perfect. Um, if you have a phone and you could scan that, that would just give us a record of your attendance and we can get you uh, important information about things that are going on. If that is a little bit uh, too tech savvy for you, there's a paper copy in the chair in front of you. You can drop that um, in the offering plate in just a couple minutes when that goes by at the end of the service. But I do want to point out a couple of announcements really, really quickly. Um, this February 11th is the big game. I know there's all those copyright laws. We're not supposed to say what it is. So we're going to have a tailgate after church that Sunday to prepare for that. My students in the room, we're going to come back for a watch party in here for just us students that night. Um, so I'll give you more information on Wednesday about that. And then also, on the back of your bulletin, we are still doing our baby bottle campaign. And if you know Travis Modrell, who is now our missions guy, who used to be with us regularly, he has challenged our campus specifically to 50 more baby bottles. So if you've already filled one up, I would love for you to grab a second one. We have two more Sundays. Um, any donation change you have is going to help us out with a protect for young moms in need. And so if you could grab one of those on your way out, that would be amazing. Uh, lastly, just want to say thank you again for choosing to worship with us. If you have a Bible, go to Genesis 2. I think I'm saying the right one, James. And we're going to continue our series um, in a, our series called Enough. And we're just glad you're here with us today. There we go. Hey, now w welcome. Wow. So um, it, it may be awkward in here right now, but I just came from the children's area like 10 minutes ago and there were 28 elementary kids when I walked out and they were still coming in. And so um, if we don't hear like uh, the building shake or see any puffs of smoke coming out of the building, praise God. And I didn't even look in the preschool area. So uh, a great, great Sunday uh, to be here. Love when Katie and the worship team leads us uh, to the throne of God and prepares our hearts um, and worship really isn't just preparing our hearts for the message. Worship is its own action, right? It's, it's, it's bringing ourselves before uh, the throne of God. This morning, we are looking at a scripture that most of us are familiar with. And it's one of those passages that, unfortunately, we, we have gotten so familiar with it that we, we will lose the ears to hear maybe what God is, is wanting to say to us through it. Uh, many Bible passages, we've heard so many times that they can lose their sense of, of wonder. They can lose their sense of, of uh, challenge to us because we think, I already know that. And what I want us to do is look at a familiar passage for most of us, but try to look at it with fresh eyes and, and, and see if we can pick up a message that God might have for us that's uh, maybe a little different than what we have recognized before. This is from Genesis chapter 1. We're going to spend most of our time in chapter 2, but I want to give you the bookends. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, very familiar to us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surfaces, or the surface of the waters. 
Now, your Bible is going to separate Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Remember, those numbers were not in the original. Uh, those were added later for our convenience to find different places in the Bible. And this is one of those places where maybe it wasn't the best place to start a new chapter. It probably should have been at verse 4 of chapter 2 because this first part of chapter 2 uh, really gives us the, the conclusion of, of chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, 1 through 3. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 uh, bring out all sorts of, of different uh, opinions and even debates among Christians and, and churches and in, in seminaries. And, and there's a variety of opinions in how we are to understand these two passages. And one of them suggests that Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is basically like a, a scientific lab report. That we, we read it in much the way that we would read uh, something in our science class. And so that, that's one opinion that you will hear about Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And then sometimes you'll hear uh, this idea that, no, th this is a profound poem uh, with God as the teacher. It's a profound poem. God is the teacher, and it's teaching us about creating, and it's teaching us about rest. And then some will say, well, it's, it's both. It's both of those two things. Now, I'm not here this morning to tell you one or the other because I believe in the principle of the priesthood of the believer that every Christian has the ability and the responsibility for, to interpret God's word uh, as they study God's word. But what I am here to do is to share with you some things about this particular passage that I think may give us some fresh eyes on what the focus is about. Uh, the, the, the first thing I want to point out is when you look at chapter 1, and, and we're not going to go through all of this because of, of time. I encourage you to, to go back yourself. But if you look in chapter 1, you're going to notice some patterns. In fact, in the passage that I just read, you probably picked up that it's a little bit clumsy as you read it in English. Now, I'm reading a translation that you're maybe not as familiar with. Uh, if you read it in the translation you're always uh, reading it in, you may not pick that up. But if you kind of get a different translation, you read it and, and you realize in English it seems a little awkward or repetitive at times. But, but there's, a, there's a reason to that because we've gone from Hebrew to English. So just quick picture here. On days one, two, and three, we see God separates. On days one, two, and three, God separates. On day, he separates light from darkness. That's the focus is the separation. On day two, he separates water from sky. On day three, he separates the land from the seas. And then you go into days four, five, and six, and we see that God fills what he separated. So on day four, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five, you have the fish, the birds. Day six, you have the animals and humans. Now you step back, and you look at the three days where God separates, and then you look at the following three days where God fills, and you see that there is a correspondence. So day four corresponds to day one, because in day one, God separated the light from the darkness. In day four, God uh, fills it with the sun, moon, and stars. We see that in day, day five, we see the correspondence. Day two. In day six, we see the correspondence to day three. Uh, so so there's, it's fascinating when we look at this, when we begin to think about how intentional this passage is and what it suggests to me. A careful reading of this suggests to me that there is clearly a, a, an element of poetry here. You, you have um, symmetry, you have repetition, you have rhythm, you have patterns. And when in Hebrew, you can see the, the form of chapter 1 going to chapter 2, verse 3, is what's called a chiasm. Uh, a chiasm uh, is the type of a poem that, that says uh, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. 
meaning that when you look at the poem, if you look at the first part of the poem and then the last part of the poem, you see that there is a connection. And then you, you, you go to the top and you look at the section, second section or sentence of the poem and you go to the next to last section or sentence of the poem, you see a connection. And so if you're drawing it, you would draw kind of the big connection, the little smaller connection, the little smaller, a little smaller. And so you end up having a center of the poem and then you have bookends to the poem. Now, I could go much further into this, but honestly, I, I get lost at a, at a point, and so I'm not going to try to do that to you. But what I want to point out to you is, if this is a chiasm, then you would expect that the beginning and the end of, these, of this section would, would correspond. And so, so let's look at that, the beginning of this writing. The beginning of this writing says, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void, so you start out with this picture of nothingness, this chaotic nothingness. That is the, the first thought we get in this writing. And then you go to the end of it. You go to Genesis 2, 2, at the ending of the poem. And what does God do? Nothing. All right? I mean, we start out with, with nothing, and, and God creates, and then at the end, what does God do? God does nothing. We, we translate in English sometimes that God rests, but it, it literally means God ceases, God stops, God's, God's done. And so I think here we're seeing, as, as much as, as we can get our eyes around, the fact that God is showing us what, what is creation and what is rest. Now, when we study passages of the Bible, and I confess I am the same way with this, we've been taught, we've been trained to look at the context. Uh, so if, if I'm reading from 1 Thessalonians, you want to know who Paul is. You want to know something about the town of Thessalonica. You want to know maybe what was going on in that era, maybe what was happening in the culture. You may want to know what problems there were in the church that caused the Apostle Paul to write this letter. And we understand that if we just read 1 Thessalonians in English without understanding any of that, we're going to misunderstand some things. Because it was first written, the author's intent was to the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago. Now we have these words in our time, and sometimes they, they clearly, the same thing he says to them uh, applies to us. But there are other times what, what the author says and what the author intends is, is going to them in a specific situation. So we have to step back and say, okay, well, how does that truth apply to us today? And so we all understand that, that to, to grasp a, a book of the Bible, that we need to know a little bit about what's going on around it. We need to know a little bit of the history, or, or we might miss something, or we might misinterpret. And, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. In, in Genesis, particularly these first few chapters, we don't tend to do that. We tend to just, just read them. But let's step back and ask the question like we'd ask of any other passage, what's going on when these words are written down? Well, if, if we go back about 3,400 years ago, uh, we can begin to get a little bit of that story. Uh, we know that Moses is responsible for the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, we know that Moses didn't write all of it because there are some verses that were written clearly after Moses had died. But when you read in the rest of the Bible, you read in the New Testament, it typically refers to those first five books as the books of Moses. And so we know that Moses was, was author, uh, editor, uh, influencer, that he was the primary source and the, the primary uh, writer of what we have in Genesis. And so then we need to ask the, the, the question, what was going on when these, first, when these words were first shared to the people? Well, if, if you go into the Bible and you go into Exodus, we find out that for 440 years, that the Hebrews, who would later become Israelites, that the Hebrews had been slaves in Egypt for 440 years. 
God had sent Moses to get them out of there, and God had, had sent the ten plays. God had gotten them across the Nile and performed that miracle. They walked across on dry ground, and, and now they were in the desert, and they were at Mount Sinai, and God went up into the presence of God. Uh, Moses went up into the presence of God. Then Moses came back down. He gave them the Ten Commandments. We know all that, that, that happened there, but that's the, the genesis. That's the beginning of, of the story of, of Genesis, is Moses goes up to the mountain to be with God, and he comes back. And, and this is one of the things that he shares with them. He shares these words. Uh, in, in the seventh day, look again at verse uh, 2 and 3 of chapter 2. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So let's step back from our, our modern comfort uh, today, and let's read these words as if we were hearing them, because these words weren't first written, they were first audibly shared. Let's, let's go back and imagine that we had been slaves for generations and generations and generations. Our family had been slaves in Egypt. We had cried out to God. God had sent a deliverer. The deliverer had brought us out of slavery through, through miracles and through God's hand. And now that we were in the desert preparing to go in, into the promised land, we, we, we had a pause. And Moses tells this story. Moses uh, repeats this story that we find in Genesis chapter 1 in chapter 2. What would that mean to you? I mean, put yourself in their shoes. What are you hearing as, as this story is shared for you? It's as if God is saying to them, hey, before you go in any further, I need you to know how to rest. Before you go another step on this journey, I need you to know when to stop. Before you continue down this road, I need you to know when to say, I've done enough. It's, it's like God is starting them off knowing that he is the creator and that creation involves rest, that work also leads to rest. Uh, if I could get my, my youngest here, Hallie, can you hand me that? Bring me my, my bottle there. I forgot to bring this up here. The, the, yeah, my, my, what do you call that, thermosy thing down there. This is not one of the popular brands that's out there now, whatever. This is the Amazon.com cheapy uh, version. But if, if I hold this um, right here, how much do you think it weighs? And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's probably halfway full. It's got quite a bit of ice. Uh, how, how much do you think this weighs? 15 ounces? 15 pounds. I mean, somewhere around, you know, maybe a pound. Someone got a scale. We can put it on there. But in, in, in practical purposes, as, as I hold this out here, it doesn't really matter to me how much it weighs. What matters is how long I hold on to it. Because when I hold on to it for a few seconds, it's no big deal. But if I hold on to it for a few minutes, I'm going to start having pain. If I hold on to it for a few hours, I am going to be tortured. Because at some point, I have to put it down. And what happens in our society, what happens in our, in our culture, is we're always doing we're always holding on to something. We're always carrying a weight and carrying a burden. And that's what the Hebrews had done. That's what the future Israelites had done. They were slaves, and they were working seven days a week, and they were making bricks. And their value was simple. You were as valuable as the number of bricks that you can make a day. And if you stop making the right number of bricks, if you stop meeting the quota, then your family is at risk. You are at risk. You won't have any food to eat. Their value was in work. And now God is showing them there's also going to be value in you learning to rest. What happens when we don't rest? What happens when we don't practice rest? Well, we will say we're overworked. 
right? We, we feel overworked. And so, sometimes it may not be that you, your work is uh, too many hours of the week. It's that your brain doesn't leave work at work. And you go home from work and you think about work. And you, you feel this burden, you feel this pressure, you feel like I didn't get this done, I didn't get that done. And so we can get overworked, not just because of, of the hours we spend working, but because we focus on it too much. We, when we don't rest, we feel overspent. We feel like I have an emotional reservoir that can take this much and it's all been taken. I've got nothing left. I've got a relational you know, uh, reservoir and it's, it's been shot. And I have a, an energy and a happiness and a friendliness reservoir. And it's, it's just emptied. I am overspent uh, when we don't rest. And then we feel overconnected. We feel overconnected. It's like I'm always surrounded by information. I'm always accessible. There's always a chime. You know, if you're watching a, a TV show and someone on the TV show has the same kind of phone as you do, and, and the character on the TV show gets a text message and you hear that sound, you reach for your pocket, right? You, you, you automatically assume that it's, it's, it's you. We're, we're overconnected. I mean, you don't have to try to convince people anymore that the cell phone has a dark side. You don't have to convince people anymore that social media can, can really suck the life out of you. We, we kind of know that. We, we get so overwhelmed. And, and the, the reality is when we get to this place where it's all, it's all effort, it's all work, it's all busyness and little to no rest, usually we, we go to one of two extremes. Maybe you're like this as well. One extreme is an unhealthy control to, to con, an unhealthy desire to control. Now, we all struggle with wanting to be in control, right? We want to be in control of our lives. We want to be in control of our, of our circumstances, of our family. And, and, and what happens is we get this unhealthy desire to control things that we have no control over. I mean, the only thing I have control over is me, right? I really don't have control over my kids. I don't have control over my wife. I don't have, I don't have control over most of what's in my life. I might have influence in areas, but control, basically I'm in, in charge of, of me. But we'll get so overwhelmed that we, we put our energy into trying to control others and control circumstances and control the work environment and control the family environment because we want everything to feel together. We don't want to feel this sense of being overwhelmed. Or, or we go from, from that extreme to the other extreme to this unhealthy passivity. An unhealthy passivity where we basically look like we've given up. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for, for, for you. I don't have time for this, for this problem. I just... I'm going to get on the couch with a bag of, of, of Frito scoops and, and I'm going to stream something and I'm going to watch 12 episodes straight. You know, I'm just, I'm, it's too much. We have to be so careful that we don't allow ourselves to, to get overwhelmed. You know, the, the Chinese, if you've, if you've uh, looked at the, the writings of the Chinese, it is in a, in a lot of ways picture-based. And the, it doesn't really look like letters. It looks like, like characters. It looks like drawings. And the word for busyness is actually a combination of two characters. And when you put these two characters, there's no space between them. You cram them together. You have one pictograph. You have one word. And that is the combination of two words. And one word uh, is the word heart, and the other word is the word killing. The idea here being that busyness, you're killing your heart. You're robbing your joy. You're robbing your physical well-being. You are killing the heart. And I think there's some wisdom and insight in there. When we are overworked, when we are overwhelmed, when we're overspent, when we feel like it's just too much, life is going just too fast, it's, I'm overconnected. When we start feeling like this, what happens to us because we're human is we begin to see maybe a slight little slit in, in your character. 
I mean, it's just a slight one, and you can, you can push back. You can keep that stuff on the inside, but there's just a slight little fissure there. And, and then you, you notice that it, over time, it becomes cracks in, in your character, and it's kind of harder to keep that, that ugliness on the inside. It's kind of hard to, to keep those issues on the inside, and then you go from cracks to, to, to a rupture, and it just all bursts out. And, and your character that you've so carefully held together your character that you've so tightly tried to kind of control and present, this is who I am, this is how I am, and all of a sudden, you just aren't so pretty anymore because you, you've, just, you've just lost it. You've just snapped. It's just too much. You're overwhelmed. And God comes to the Hebrews here when they're at a place when they're having to learn the idea of rest, and he is presenting them with an understanding, a framework of their world that with work comes rest you know, God doesn't hear command a day of rest. You notice that? God doesn't even uh, institute the Sabbath yet. The seventh day is, is different than the, the coming of the Sabbath. God simply sets the example. He simply says, this is, this is who I am. This is what I have done. And this is how uh, you can see that there's a pattern. You, you work six days, and then the seventh day, you rest. He sets the pattern. And then what does it say that God did? What does the scripture tell us? One, God blessed it. God looked at the seventh day, and God blessed it. Now, has anyone ever, like, given you a blessing? Like, looked you in the eyes and said just words of affirmation and said, you know, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord, I, I just I want to give a blessing to you, and I want to, to just see God thriving in your life, and I want, and they just say these words of kindness, maybe it's during prayer, and they're just literally speaking a blessing over you, and just how that just kind of lifts us up. And here it says God is blessing the seventh day. He's putting this honor and this intention and this meaning in the seventh day. God blesses it. And the God sets it apart. He, he says it's distinctive from the other days. It's, it's different than the other days. That's what the word holy means. It means distinct. It means set apart. He says the seventh day is set apart. And then God simply does not work. It's as if the creator... It's as if the, the creator of the universe, the almighty God, after the six days of creation, on the seventh day, he sits back, he, he relaxes, and he enjoys the perfection of the creation that he sees in front of him. He ceases work. He stops working. Scripture tells us here that... Um, when we, when we rest, we see so often in the Bible that along with the word rest comes the idea of connecting with God, of relationship with God, even of, of worship in God. And when we, we rest, we find ourselves more attentive to the presence of God and more attentive to the presence of others. And so it really just begs the question for you and for me, when do you unplug from work, from entertainment, from exercise, from electronics, and the big one for me, from expectations. I mean, when do you unplug from all of that and just be in the space that you're in? Just be your, your Abba's child. Just be your, your, your father's uh, child. Just enjoy the creation that is around you. If we don't have margins in our lives, our lives become a mess. Just like if you write on a piece of paper in a spiral notebook and, and you go from one end of the big side of the page to the complete other side of the page and you skip the margins, it's really hard to make sense of that paper, isn't it? It's just it's too much to the eyes. You've got to have margins. God is saying, if you want to thrive, you've got to have margins in your life. If you want to be effective in your job, then you can't do your job every single day. If you want to be effective in your parenting, then you can't allow your parenting to drive every waking moment of every day. There has to be margin. There has to be rest. You know, for some of us, let's be honest. We think of a day of rest, and we think that means that we go to church and that means that uh, we read the Bible, and that means we pray. And for some of us, when, when we, we make ourselves rest, we actually are setting ourselves up to, for tasks that we must do. 
Instead of rest being relaxing, instead of rest being more attentive and attuned to God, we feel like, oh, here's another thing I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to read this much of the Bible. I'm supposed to journal, you know, at least two pages. We set these things up in our mind, and the very thing God wants to give us rest can just be more busyness. See, I can't tell you what rest looks like for you. Rest for you might include putting on some tennis shoes and running 10 miles. And you're running those 10 miles and you're praising God in your heart and you're seeing his creation and you're feeling the, just the blood pumping through your body and, and through your heart and your mind is clear and you feel closer to God by running 10 miles than you could do with anything else. That others uh, think about running 10 miles and we think that is torture. That is not just work. That is pure torture. It, please no. Your rest might be different than my rest. The question we have to ask ourselves is, when do I unplug? And when I unplug, when I rest, is what I do giving me a greater sense of attention to God, a greater sense of attention to people around me, a greater sense of attention of the world around me, or is it creating more stress? If it's creating more stress, then maybe we're not doing it the right way. So my, my message, very simply, uh, ends with this. This is one of those sermons that I wish I could tell you how to do it. I, I wish I could give you the three steps. I wish I could just kind of package it and maybe sell it, and, you know, here, 20 bucks, and, you know, I'll give you the secret. But I, there's, there's nothing like that. The reality is God calls you to rest. God calls me to rest. You may be at a stage of life where taking a full day off uh, from your responsibilities is literally impossible. In fact, if you did it, someone would call CPS and say, there's these kids running in the street wild, and I don't know where their parents are. Oh, they're resting. No, that, that's just not realistic, right? You may be in a heavy, heavy project at work, and, and, and your job depends upon it, and it's, it's, it's D-Day, it's go day, and you say, oh, I'm not coming in today, I'm, I've got to rest, this, I had a sermon Sunday on rest. I've got to rest. And you're going to be resting a long time because you're getting fired, right? And you can't blame me for that. But find places in your schedule that are for rest. And, and for some people like me whose brains are always going, you really have to define what does that look like for me? When am I at rest? How do I get at rest? How do I get recharged? How do I get renewed? And then you put that in your schedule. In your stage of life, it may be a 10-minute window. It may be a 15-minute window. I know some people who get up real early so they can beat their kids out of bed. And that's their time of rest. But this week, let's remember our creator who created this world and showed us a pattern of six days of work and a seventh day of rest. And remember, God didn't need rest. Scripture doesn't say he, he rested. It says he ceased. He just stopped. He sat back and he enjoyed. Let's pray together. God, this is a great big concept to bite off because, Lord, so often when I read this uh, passage, I just think about, um, about creation and just kind of fly through the whole, on the seventh day, God rested. But I know, Lord, we come in here and we're in a society that we just don't know how to rest. We're just driven. We're driven. We have constant access to entertainment, to news, emails, text, social media. We have some of us hundreds of acquaintances, maybe a thousand or more acquaintances, but we long for a friend. And God, I can't tell anyone how to rest. I have to struggle to figure that out myself at times. But I know that you are good, that you are God, and that you created this world in a way that there is beauty for me to see, to experience for each of us. That there is a place where we can still and quiet our souls, whether it be a day, whether it be 10 minutes, 
but we could regain perspective. That that problem maybe isn't as overwhelming as we've made it out to be. Maybe that snub or that slight isn't such a big deal. Maybe that argument with my spouse or, or, or my kid is, maybe it doesn't deserve so much space in my mind. Maybe we're just carrying something that doesn't weigh that much, but over time, it's just overwhelming. We just got to put it down. Lord, would you do something in us right now to draw us to you, to draw us to rest? Lord, may we be a place that builds one another up, that encourages one another, that leads one another to connect not only with new friends, but to connect with you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. As we sing this song of worship, it's just a time of, of response. You may want to come and kneel at the altar. If you want to come and speak to a pastor, I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, you may have questions about what it means to give your life to Christ. And scripture says, then you enter into his rest. You may want to join the church. I don't know if you want to respond or simply reflect. But this is your time for God to work in your heart as we sing this song together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. Steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. For he has said that he will bring me 
and help us to give with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Welcome to Walnut Ridge, where our mission is to love God, love others, and make disciples. On February 14th, it's Valentine's Day. It's also Wednesday night, so we have the perfect solution. Celebrate together with your kids here at church. Tables will be set and decorated. We will offer pizza, applesauce, chips, and to top the night off with dessert, making your own Sundays. Sign up with another preschool family and reserve your tables together today. We are excited for a fun night with our preschool families. Next Sunday, after services and before you settle in to watch the game, join us for a pre-Super Bowl tailgating hamburger lunch that promises to fuel your excitement and satisfy your cravings. Great food, great company, and a great time. It's the perfect kickoff to the big game. Join us as we celebrate life and the wonderful ministry of the Metroplex Women's Clinic. Learn how they impact the lives of thousands of young women and their babies each year, offering hope through education and compassion. Through February 11th, participate with us in the Baby Bottle Campaign, filling each bottle with donations which directly impact the life of a child. Baby bottles will be available at each exit and are due by February 11th. More information about these events can be found in the bulletin or mobile app. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Well, now that uh, those announcements, we have two campuses, a 360 campus and we're the West Campus. And on all honesty, I don't know if that first announcement is for us or if that's just for 360. Uh, normally, I, we catch those sort of things before Sunday morning, but every once in a while, one slips in there. So if anyone knows, you can tell me. I'll pass that on. How's that? Um, we are excited that, that, that you're here. And uh, on, on your way out, you notice there are four tables uh, set up that have a little bit of information about a, a Ridge class. Uh, we kind of have two opportunities uh, for you in the, in the uh, winter months, in the coming spring months. Uh, we, we typically will start a couple of uh, D groups. Uh, during this time, a D group is kind of a uh, gathering where you, you meet with a small group, maybe at a coffee shop, maybe Sunday right after church, uh, but you work through reading a, a chapter of the Bible each day and uh, building uh, relationships with God through those habits and through discipleship. And we can help you find someone uh, to be in a group with you. If you're interested in that, they, they meet times and places uh, according to, to the group. But then we have uh, six-week Ridge classes, which are here. Wednesday night at 6.30, we have something for the preschoolers, the children, the students, and the, the adults are four choices. Uh, we'll have a grief share uh, class that will start this Wednesday. If, if you're struggling from a recent loss or from a loss a long time ago, and it's still just kind of pulling you down, uh, and you want to get with others that maybe have, have been there and can just, you know, talk through it and learn some principles from God's Word that are going to help you do, do that. Uh, you can get information out back for that. Uh, we have uh, two classes for women. One is called Well-Watered well Women. And if you're not really familiar with Scripture, that probably sounds like a peculiar name. But uh, Jesus gives us living water. He refreshes us, and that's the idea there. Uh, and then we have another class that uh, Marsha will be leading. And uh, someone remind me which that is. I didn't bring my notes up here. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And uh, that, that will be really uh, a meaningful class as well. And then the guys class, now this curriculum actually is for men or women, but we're just doing it as a guys class just because, hey, there are two ladies classes. The guys got to have something, right? And it's seeing God as your perfect father. And it's really looking at your relationship with your, your um, earthly father, but then seeing that your relationship with your heavenly father is something different something even greater, something even better. Maybe your earthly father wasn't great, but uh, seeing your relationship with God as you see it with 
God is your heavenly Father. So we hope you'll come. And uh, this Wednesday night, we, we want Wednesday night to be a fellowship time where the newcomers and members uh, from long time can come together and kind of rub elbows and meet one another and get connected. So this Wednesday night, we have Cain's Chicken. Uh, and french fries uh, that we'll have from about 6 to 6.30. And so just come and grab something to eat and then uh, go try one of those four classes. And uh, we would love to know how much chicken to order. And so there's a QR code, uh, I think, in your bulletin. If not, you can see a QR code on one of those four tables or send me an email and let's, let me know we're coming so we have plenty of food for you. So we are, are glad you're here. And you know, the, the one volunteer team that you never notice or think about until something goes wrong, but it almost never goes wrong because our tech team is so awesome. They do a great job. And, and you barely know they're here until one Sunday when my mic doesn't work or two weeks ago when my sermon went long and they turned all the lights off. But that, we got to of that, so that was a good one. But no, it's, it's so rare that anything goes wrong because they do a phenomenal job and we appreciate them. So uh, let's pray together. And then I hope on the way out, you'll, you'll meet someone you don't know. Uh, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. And most of all, we thank you for rest. And Lord, when, when we come across uh, a brother and sister in Christ, who's obviously just overwhelmed, obviously just over overspent, overconnected, and they're struggling. Uh, help us to have the grace to speak encouragement to them and to uh, just help them, remind them to enter into, into rest, because we all need that reminder. We all get so caught up in our, in our lives that, that we forget that we're not made to go 24-7. Uh, we're made to work and then follow your example and, and cease to, to stop and the rest, Lord. Uh, give us that blessing, and through rest, may we draw closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.